following announcement has been paid for by the new Howl Order. Whether the team has given us the highest of highs or the bluest of blues, we'll cover it all here on Commander's Nightly News. I, of course, am your host, Louis T. Thank you for joining me. Let's get to tonight's lead story. So I've got a bevy of topics to discuss with you today. Um, <clears throat> I had an interesting question somebody posed to me on social media. I want to share that with you guys and kind of go over that one. Um, I also want to talk about um, EB's offensive scheme. I I've been seeing a lot of things that I think are erroneous, uh, misleading when it comes to EB's scheme. So I want to address that. And the overwhelming impact of the Bears outcome in that entire game. And I think that's where I'm going to start. I think I'm going to work in reverse order. Start with the last thing that I just talked about, the Bears game, go to EB, and then talk about this uh, comment. So I didn't really, and, and I, we had this discussion last night on the uh, CNN Live, and we had callers call in, and um, it, it made me think about how I felt in the moment, and I, I think I shared this with you guys last night, that um, I remember watching the game thinking, this is really bad. Like, I felt so embarrassed and just, it was just this level of disbelief that I hadn't felt in this team in a while. And, and there have been some games where I just was like, what am I watching right now? That Lions game last year in the first half, like, what am I watching right now, right? But that wasn't this, right? The, the Bears' loss was so bad because the Bears are so bad, like, they're not just going to turn around and win four of their next five more likely than not. They've got a schedule that would allow them to do that. I just think they're a bad football team. And I don't think that's what's going to ultimately happen. I just think we didn't show up. And they did. And they took it to us at home on primetime television. And fans are just having a hard time wrapping their brains around it. Now, we, we, we talk about the impact of potentially losses like that and what it could do to the morale of the fan base, but the commanders just posted on X that it's a sellout for week eight against the Philadelphia Eagles. So, um, again, I think that's going to be a lot of Eagles fans. I think it's, it might be 60-40. It might be 55-45. You know, I think a lot of commanders fans might have bailed on them and sold their tickets to Eagles fans. But they don't really care at this point. They just want asses in seats. They would prefer them to be commanders' asses and butts in seats. But um, it's another sellout. And they get to say, hey, we sold out another game. You know, that's four straight to start the season off, which is fine and dandy. But if it's not an actual home crowd and, and, and a home field advantage, doesn't really do you much good now, does it? Which is what they're trying to facilitate. They're trying to foster a home advantage environment and losing the way that they did in the last two home games doesn't do that so that bears loss i i haven't seen this fan base that upset that disappointed that shaken to their core from a fandom standpoint in, in a while and we've had some bad losses and i think i'll say this and we'll leave it alone we'll move on that was the worst loss of the Ron Rivera era. Can we agree on that? I think that's where we are with that loss. And it felt like in the moment, and it still feels like that to, to me right now, like that was the final nail in Ron's coffin. But we'll see what happens. Still 12 games to go for Ron to maybe change the narrative a bit and give himself a fighting chance. I still think no matter what happens, he's fired. But uh, again, it's hard to say that they win the next 12 games and finish the season off 14 and three and win a playoff game or two. Is he fired? Probably not. Right. But that's not going to happen. We all know better than that. That's not going to happen. OK, so uh, for those of you worried about is Ron going to be back, the likelihood is Ron's shown you who he is already as a coach. And the likelihood is this team is who they are. They're going to win games. They're going to have that resurgence. They're going to they're gonna be in the playoff discussion. They probably won't make it, but they'll be in it at the end of the season. So, anyway. Um, EB's offensive scheme. I just wanted to touch on this quickly because I've been seeing a lot of things. People have been asking me questions and been making comments. Um, 
directed at EB's offense to me in particular. And, you know, I think some of these comments are, I, I, I think they're inaccurate is what I'll say. You know, I, I've heard some people say that, you know, EB is being reckless and um, he's, he's out for self. He's trying to promote his opportunity and himself to get a head coaching job, which that's what every coach in a co- coordinator position is doing. He's auditioning for the other 31 teams around the league to potentially be a head coach. In EB's case, he's probably auditioning for all 32, right? Because even this job is potentially uh, available and he may be in consideration for this job as well. That said, for those of you who are ranting and raving um, and, and upset, let's just say that, about EB's offense and, and putting Sam at risk and the five-man protections. We lead the NFL currently in five-man protections, which means it's essentially an empty set. Or your running back is in the backfield, but he's not staying in the block. He's getting into the, the route. He's in the play, right? So we're out in front of everybody by a country mile, which with the offensive line that isn't great, puts your quarterback at greater risk, especially if the ball's not coming out very rapidly. That said, Sam's held on to it, and he's a part of the equation of the sacks, and we've talked about that. Um, So are the tight ends, the running back. Everybody's got a hand in it. It's not just the offensive line. But EB's scheme also is partly to blame for this because if you know your offensive line has struggled a bit, um, you you probably shouldn't be leaving them on an island one-on-one to fend for themselves. That said, this is his scheme. He's not going out of his way to put Sam at risk. He's not doing something abnormal to put Sam in a position to fail or go out of his way to try to prove something to other teams around the league. This is his philosophical belief as a head coach or as an offensive coordinator and a play caller, rather. You know who's second in the league in most five-man protections? You guessed it, the Kansas City Chiefs, right? So essentially what I'm telling you is he got that from Kansas City. He got this mindset from Andy Reid. A lot of what we're running is from Kansas City. All right. So the biggest difference is Patrick Mahomes gets rid of the football faster. He's seen NFL defenses for the last, you know, five, six years. He's way more comfortable in the scheme. He's been in it his entire career. And so the ball comes out a lot quicker. They've spent resources on their offensive line, whether it be draft picks or actual money and free agency to fortify that line in front of Mahomes. So he's not running around like a chicken with his head cut off. Has it always worked out for them? No, but at least they've you know, made the effort. That said, that we're at the beginning phase of that process. And what sucks is for Mahomes, that process has never changed for him, not once. When he got there, Andy Reid drafted him, and all he's ever known is Andy Reid as his, essentially as his play caller. Or an offensive scheme that Andy Reid has essentially built and it hasn't changed. Maybe the guy calling the um, plays into his helmet have changed, right? It was EB for about five years. Now it's Matt Nagy. Maybe that's changed. But it's the same scheme. It's the same offense. For, For Sam, this is his second year. It's his second different offense. And next year he might be in a third different offense, which sucks. At the end of the day, I just wanted to reinforce that EV's offensive scheme is his scheme. He got it from Kansas City. This five-man protection stuff isn't EB trying to show that he can be this grandiose play caller or this guy that can, you know, do wonders uh, without, you know, protecting his quarterback. This isn't Steve Spurrier thinking he's bringing the fun and gun to the NFL with five-man protections and getting Patrick Ramsey killed. This is EB's scheme. And they're adjusting to it. But we've seen what happens when it works, when the ball comes out quickly. I think the best example of what this offense is supposed to look like is the Philadelphia game. 
And if we can get back to that, I think we'll have a ton of success in this scheme. But, you know, again, we'll see what happens. So, lastly, I wanted to talk about a comment that I received from my guy, King of the North. Uh, he DM'd me on socials. And um, this was what he wrote. This is what he had to say. I think you nailed it on CNN talking about Washington being unable to win when expectations are high. My question to you is, what exactly is the root cause of that? I don't think it's players being intimidated or players buying into the hype too much after a win. What is it about this team that makes them crumble under high expectations? I think that is a really, really good question. I think that's the million dollar question right now. And I think arguably after quarterback which has been a massive question mark with this team for decades. You know, sands for when Kirk Cousins was here. The next biggest question is the what has been the issue with handling expectations? We haven't done that ever. Even going back to Gibbs 2.0, we haven't handled expectations. If you go back to Gibbs 2.0, we make the playoffs. We win a playoff game in 05. Gibbs scraps his offense, brings in Al Saunders, changes everything. The expectations are high in 06, and we fall flat on our face. Were there injuries? Sure, but that wasn't the, the, the bulk of the reason why. We just didn't handle the success of 05 very well. Made too many changes. Um. 07 was a crazy run, you know, Sean Taylor's death, all of that, you know, it was just too much for Joe to handle. <clears throat> but even 08, you you know, it was a wonky uh, process to get to Jim Zorn as the head coach. But he starts the season off five and two. And we all know how that ended, right? 2012. Excellent season. It ends in disaster with Robert going down on the FedEx field turf. He's all in for week one in 2013. And that was an abject disaster that ended in everybody being fired. Robert was never the same. Yada, yada, yada. We win the division in 2015. Expectations are through the roof in 2016. We start the first game of the season against the Steelers at home. I've told this all. I've I've said this a million times, but it's always funny every time I think about it. Antonio Brown is twerking on us. Um, we have every opportunity to, to make it to the playoffs that year, and we just don't. You know, misses in, in Detroit and Cincinnati. Uh, you know, over in London, the, the final game of the season against the Giants when they had nothing to play for. There's tons of examples of. Us just not rising to the occasion with opportunities in front of us. That like Giants one was the exclamation point. Giants have nothing to play for. Expectations are low for them. You just go in there and take care of business and you're in playoffs. And we can do it. You get all the way to 2020. That's the next time you finally make something of a season. Uh, again, expectations for whatever reason i don't i still don't know why the expectations were high in 2021 you went seven and nine and won the division i kept telling everybody we are not a good football team and ryan fitzpatrick isn't going to change that but people were excited and there were expectations and people got mad when we stunk that year i don't know why but we've seen it throughout ron's entire tenure you know expectations are extremely low um this team fares well, expectations rise with the success of the team, and we falter in those instances and play some of our worst football. That's been the constant theme. Whereas my guy, Joe Rockhead, eloquently put it, false death, which is what we're currently experiencing right now, false death, false, re false resurrection, which is what happens after everybody pronounces us dead, but we're really not dead. We win, you know, last year, six out of seven. The year before that, four in a row. The year before that, four in a row. And you come back to life, even though you were never dead. And then you finally really do die. Your season finally does really die. 
at the end. Losing four straight. Last year we lost, what, three out of our final four. Um, the year before that, we lost four out of five. And the year before that, if not for a bad division, we lost two out of our final three games and um, would have missed the playoffs. But again, luckily enough for us, the rest of the division stunk. So um, we know what it is. Here's my take on it. Personally, EB said a lot today. And we're going to talk about his press conference because it was 24 minutes of what the F just happened. Okay, so we'll get to that in a second. But something that he did say in there that made a ton of sense um, was his impact on the rest of the offense. You know, he said, look, these guys are looking to me to be the leader. My energy is infectious. If I seem flustered or confused or you know, anything of the sort, they're going to take on my demeanor. Which is true of any leader in a leadership role. The people that are following you are looking to you for leadership. And however you conduct yourself, that's how they're going to move. So if you, if you project bravado, confidence, if you project this is how we're going to do things because we are capable of doing this and here's how we're going to do it. And you speak with a level of confidence that people can get behind. You're going to have people that believe and all of a sudden you look like the Detroit Lions playing for Dan Campbell. I personally believe why we crumble under expectations is because Ron himself hasn't set the tone. Every time we play in a big game, Ron has an opportunity to set the tone, and he just doesn't. Jack Del Rio said something, and again, I told you Jack's presser was going to be seven minutes. Did I not tell you that? said he's been pretty much consistent at nine for much of the year. I said, I bet you this next one's right around seven minutes. It was seven minutes. Ron didn't have, or Jack didn't have a lot to say. I didn't think he would. Here's what he did say, though. He said that in reference to Emmanuel Forbes, words aren't going to help him. There's nothing I can say that's going to change him. He's going to have to put in the work, essentially. Ron can talk until his face turns blue during the course of the week. And he can spew this message of, hey, this is what we got to do, guys. And he can use all of his little phrases that he uses. Um, and hammer home the point of this is what we got to go out and do, men. Because the truth of the matter is you control your own destiny, which you don't because destiny is already preordained. And I hate when people say that, but whatever. That sounds like some shit Ron would say because the truth of the matter is we can win, right? Well, that sounds good, but you know what makes the players believe that? When you exude that confidence and then you go out and you show action behind that. All right. We call it taking actionable steps. Case in point, Giants game last year after the bye. Giants came. They went for it on fourth and seven. They weren't looking to come here to, to have another tie and they damn sure weren't scared of losing they were coming here to win meanwhile we're punting from the giants 35 i mean 38 37 yard line whatever it was i think we even punted on a fourth and four ron wanted to play the field position game and the giants they just they came in and they weren't scared and his team was literally week one last season. Brian Dayball came in and he set the tone with his team. They had a chance to kick an extra point in week one on the road at Tennessee. Mind you, Tennessee is a division winning team, been to the playoffs three straight years. They're viewed as a really good team in the league at the time. 
They're on the road. Nobody's giving them a chance to beat Tennessee in week one. And they could kick the extra point and go to overtime. You know what Brian Debo said? F that. Either we're winning this game right now or we're losing this game. But I believe in you. That's how you instill confidence. And that's how you set the tone. That's what the Giants did last year. You see what that did for them confidence-wise. You see how they ended up playing last year. They believed because their, their coach believed in them first. Meanwhile, our coach had a chance to go for two and win against the Eagles, and he kicks the extra point. Our coach had a chance after a third and 12, 10-yard scramble by Sam Howe, had a chance to go for it on fourth and two, and he decides to kick a field goal. Scare money don't make money. You want guys to rise to the occasion. You want to change the narrative. You got to instill that confidence in these guys. No matter what happens, we're not scared. And this is how we're going to play, and this is how we're going to play all the time. And Ron, he sent mixed signals to this team since he got here. 2020, we were going for it on two, uh, for two at the end of a ball game. We haven't done it since. It didn't work, and he got scared. These, these players don't know what this team is. They're searching for an identity. Your identity comes from your head coach. So when the expectations rise, it doesn't change in the building because you already know what the expectations are because it was set by your head coach. So when people start telling you you're really good, your coach already told you that six weeks ago before the season started. So you already know that you're good. And when he goes out and he goes for it on fourth down or he goes for two at the end of a ball game to win, he's already instilled that confidence in you that no matter what happens, I believe in you. So when people start telling you that you're trash, that you've lost two in a row and you're not good, you're not buying into that because your coach already told you six weeks ago, eight weeks ago, before the season started, this is who we are, this is who we're going to be, and this is how we're going to play football. But that's not what Ron's ever done here. He sent mixed signals. His arms are folded on the sidelines. You're getting your ass kicked at halftime. He doesn't say anything to the team. This is the message that he's conveyed to his players. They'll figure it out. I didn't say anything. Our guys were tired, so we didn't go for two. I thought that we could play the field position game, so I punted instead of going for it. I felt like in that moment we needed points. So I didn't go for it on fourth and two versus the Bears. These are all the excuses that you make when you're a loser. That's just my two cents. We don't handle expectations well because they don't know who they are. They don't have an identity. In order to understand the psyche of a situation, you got to first know who you are. We don't. Our players don't know who they are as a team. They don't know if they're aggressive, if they're passive. They don't know if we're supposed to be going for it here. Are we going to settle for a field goal? Are we going to punt? Teams that know. Bro, we just got to get two more yards here on third down. We're going for it on fourth down. You don't think that changes their mindset? If it's third and ten and they get eight yards, you don't think they already know? We're going for this. Coach is going for this shit. If I'm a player... I'm fighting for that extra yard or two because I know if we get to fourth and four, fourth and three, coach is going for it. But if it's fourth and seven, fourth and six, coach is going to punt. That changes the way you approach a play as a player. You hear it all the time. Well, this play caller is going to, you know, change the way he calls his play. He's got two plays to get four yards. He knows he's going for it on fourth down so he can run it on third down. Well, you don't think a player thinks that way? It's It's third and ten. And I may be able to fight for an extra yard or two and make it fourth and four. I know coach is going for it then. If it's fourth and six, coach is probably going to punt the ball. I think personally, we don't handle expectations because it starts from the top. Starts from having that confidence instilled in you that no matter what, whether you're up or you're down, we know who we are. We've never had that from Ron. He's never established that. Anyway, just my two cents. Let's get to in other news. Um, 
Heard from the coordinators today. Interesting stuff. <laughs> we'll talk about that in a second. Um, but before we do that, let's take a look at the injury report for both teams. Um, pretty much what we expected. We talked about this yesterday. Curtis Hodges, um, you know, back at practice today. I told you, anytime you see a guy with an illness, I, I just look at it as day to day. You don't know how it's going to go. You don't know how ill they really are, but just know it's day to day. Uh, he was back at practice today, full participant. Christian Holmes, hamstring. My guess is he'll be out of this game, and and we're going to miss him. We've been missing him this season. Um, Charles Leno Jr., C Curtis Samuel, both with finger injuries, were full participants yesterday, full participants today. I, I, they're not going to be on the injury report. Uh, and, and F.A. Obata, as we know, 21-day uh, window opened up yesterday. He's a full participant. He's back. So uh, I don't think anyone will ultimately be on this injury report for Washington except Christian Holmes. And I don't think he's going to play in this game. Meanwhile, you look at it from the Bears' perspective, or Bears, Falcons' perspective. Um, Calais Campbell was out yesterday, as we talked about, not injury related. So he was back at practice today. He's not on the injury report. Bud Dupree, wrist, full participant today. Caleb McGarry, knee, something to keep an eye on. I expect him to play, but um, he's a starting um, tackle for them. So uh, they definitely need him in the lineup. And John o. Smith, Ankle, full participant. I, I surmise that this entire Falcons injury report will be blank. I don't even know if they'll have a, a player on it. Maybe Caleb McGarry will be questionable, but I expect him to play, to be honest with you. So, uh, there's that. Um, so, we heard from the coordinators today. And, whew, did we ever. Uh, let's just start with Jack, because there's a lot to... To discuss with EB. So Jack kept it nice, short, and sweet, as we expected him to. Um, I knew he would be short on words. A lot of the questions that they were going to ask, he wasn't going to answer because he doesn't really talk about anything scheme specific, which is all anybody really wants to talk about. Why are you playing so much man? You're getting carved up in it. You should be playing zone. Uh, but, but, then, but then when you do play zone, your safety in particular, Percy Butler, isn't handling it well. So uh, what are you going to do? And Jack's like, I'm not talking about that. So you can go ahead and slice off a third of the questions that you guys had because you already know he's not going to answer it. You can try, but Jack's not going to fall for the banana in the tailpipe. Uh, then he was asked about the safeties. And, and I had somebody hit me in my DM today. And he, he, he had this, you know, uh, outside the box thought on what we could do to alleviate some of the pressure uh, at safety, right? He's like, hey, man. You know, why don't we, you know, move Cam Curl, you know, further away from the line of scrimmage and put Kalik Hudson on the field? And, you know, that would keep us in a situation where, you know, you don't have to, you know, play Percy Butler as much or you don't have to play Quan Martin at all. And I'm like, that's not, I say, I see what you're doing there. So you're trying to think outside the box. Speaking of Kalik Hudson, Jack had something to say or not to say about him we'll talk about that in a second but i told this guy and i'll read you my exact quote to him um that i sent him and i told him i said i see you thinking outside the box but that's not how they're they are thinking this is exactly what they drafted Quan martin and percy butler for depth i put that in all caps now it's time to lean on that depth and that's what they're prepared to do for better or for worse. So that's what I, I said to him. And that's exactly what Jack pretty much said. Is that, hey, this is why we drafted Quan. Because somebody said, well, Quan hasn't played a single defensive snap this year. You know, wh why is that? Was he not ready? And they was like, no, we were good. We just had, we had safeties. We were good. We drafted him for depth purposes. Now our depth is being tested. He will play. So... We'll see Quan Martin at some point. We're going to see a ton of Percy Butler. We'll see how those guys fare. For better or for worse, those guys are going to be on the field. So we'll see how they pan out. But all of you screaming, these guys aren't contributing in the first, second, and third round. Well, your second round pick is about to play and play a lot. So let's see how he does. Um, Jack uh, was asked about Emmanuel Forbes. And he pretty much said, hey, look, that's not the start we wanted him to get off to. I still have confidence in him. It's the NFL. It's the same thing Kendall Fuller said. It's the NFL. Shit happens. 
you know, you, you go through these kinds of growing pains. Um, he just needs to continue to work on his technique, continue to, to be fundamentally sound. And, you know, he'll get more opportunities. We don't have any choice. We don't have a ton of depth at corner, right? So he's going to play. It's just a matter of how much. Right now, I think they're going to roll with Danny Johnson. And if Danny holds up, you'll see a lot more Danny than you will Emmanuel Forbes. But if Danny doesn't hold up, Forbes will be back out there. So he'll play this season. So we don't have to worry about that. But he said, I, there's nothing I can say to him to motivate him or, you know, to, to get him on track. Um, all I can do is continue to build up his confidence. But at the end of the day, he's got to go out and do it. You know, so we'll see what happens with that. And then somebody asked him about Kalik Hudson. And, and this was an interesting exchange. Uh, ben Standing uh, brought up Cody Barton and he essentially talked about all the fans killing Cody Barton and PFF killing Cody Barton. And uh, he didn't say PFF, which he should have. So Jack could have lambasted PMFF, which is what I wanted him to do. But he didn't. He kept saying, you know, the, the powers that be and, and people out there. And Jack's like, who? Who's saying this? You know, give me something to work with so I can so I can fillet their ass. Who's saying this? Who's saying Cody Barton's not playing well? So, um, and, and you know, then, you know, Ben started backtracking like a lot of these media members do. He started moonwalking and stuttering and stammering around when he got challenged instead of saying PFF said he stinks. You guys use PFF. The whole league uses PFF. So what do you think? Then see what Jack says. And then he would have, Jack would have probably stood down, right, and been like, well, you know, that's their opinion. Um, but, you know, we feel good about what Cody's providing us. It's something to that effect. Instead of being, you know, stuttering and stammering around because he got challenged. Stand on your shit. Does that, if that's how you feel, if that's what you want to ask, stand on that. Ten toes down. Anyway, you know, Jack was like, get out of here with that shit. Um, Cody's fine. And, you know, we're going to keep moving forward with him. And to that point, Ben really was asking that to get to Khalid Hudson. Like, hey, you know, you guys, this was a great question by Ben. You guys propped him up all offseason after a strong showing in week 18. He got a game ball against Dallas. You talked about him all offseason, sort of like you did Defoe last year. Why isn't the guy seeing the field? And then, you know, I hate when reporters ask a question and then give the guy that they're asking the question to an out by continuing to talk. Ask your question and shut up. Don't give them an opportunity to say you just answered the question, which is what he did. Like, you know, um, we know you get it. We know you're smart enough to understand why Khalid Hudson is not playing. Let him explain that. Don't say, hey, um, you know, Cody Barton's been struggling. Khalid Hudson had a strong finish to the year. You guys have been propping him up all offseason. Um, you know, why hasn't he seen the field at all in any capacity this year? And just leave it at that. You don't have to then, after asking that, say, is there not just any space? You guys have been playing a lot of two linebackers. Is that why? Like, don't do that. Because you know what he's going to do when you do that? Yeah, you just answered the question. And that's what Jack essentially did. Don't do that. Let him say that. Let him say it. You don't answer the question for him. Too many reporters do that. They don't want to sound like they're stupid, like they don't know. We know you know what the hell you're talking about. You are on the beat for a reason. You don't have to answer the question for them. Ask the question and let them answer it. So, of course, he was like, that's it. You're playing a lot of two linebackers, and we like the two guys that are on the field right now, which is bullshit. That's part of my problem with Jack is you telling me you can't find any way to get Khalid Hudson on the field in any capacity. He's a menace around the line of scrimmage. He's an excellent blitzer. You're telling me there's no way possible you can find a way to get Khalid Hudson on the field at all. Zero chance. There's no package that you can have specifically with Khalid on the field. That's my problem with Jack. Is that everything is so cut and dry. It's black and white. And there's no gray area. There's no extra with Jack. It's you get what you see, right? You see what you get, you get what you see, and it's like, bro, you don't think they've been watching film? You don't think they know what's coming? You don't really throw anything extra at them to make them think about something. 
So they know what they have to do, and they've done it this season. You don't move any of the guys around, so they know where Duran is on every snap. They know where Chase and, and, and Montez is on every snap. So it's easy for them to chip or double team. You're not, you're not making it hard on the other team. But anyway, uh, that was Jack. So <sighs> Eric bien Wow. Wow. Um, 24 minutes long was his press conference. There is no excuse for a press conference in week six to be 24 minutes long. Um, now, what I will say is that EB projects himself as a a guy with a ton of confidence and he again I've said this before he gives me head coach vibes however somebody hit me up I think it was my guy DB who hit me up in my DM and he said man I just watched EB's presser and it was like a bad he sounded like a preacher and it sounded like a bad sermon man he was like it was bad matter of fact I'm gonna read you what my guy DB sent me um, <laughs> on socials, it was funny. Um, DB wrote, "Yo, after watching EB's press conference, I'm gonna start calling EB Pastor EB. His pes- his press conferences sound like a bad church sermon. Also, if he starts another sentence with, you know what I love and about such and such, <laughs> I'm gonna throw up. I'm just glad there's no one eight hundred number for donations." <laughs> Donations. Don't hit me. I thought it was a trash can. Um, it, it did sound really, really bad, like a sermon, like a really bad sermon. Um, he was talking in circles. He repeated himself numerous times. He, he didn't even answer half of the questions. Like he was asked about Logan Thomas and him leading the team in targets. And Ben Static was like, yo, that was cool. That shit was cool in Kansas City when you had Travis Kelsey. That shit ain't cool here. And EB pretty much was like, he started out talking about Logan Thomas and and how he, you know, this team is selfless and no one would really care if we were winning, which is false. But um, then he went off on a tangent. I don't even know what the hell he was talking about. He went off on something totally different. He was like, okay, um, so you, you cool with Logan? Leading the team in targets or not? <laughs> you know, like, that's kind of how you left that question. Like, oh, all right. I will say this. There was a lot of shit that he said. You know, most of it I could decipher what he was trying to get at. Um, one thing that he said about Sam, and he was adamant about this, is Sam's developed a lot better than they were hoping, you know. And they've expedited, and Ron has even said this, they've expedited his process, whether they wanted to or not. Um, And he's been pleased with what Sam's done, but he also was critical of Sam, and he said, Sam's got to get rid of the football. Sam can't be taking all these sacks. We don't want Sam getting hit this much. But this is our offense. And if Sam's going to play and he's going to thrive and he's going to live in this this system, he's going to have to learn how to get rid of the damn ball. We're not going to change who we are. And you know what? I don't. I, I don't dislike that. All right? I, I just used the double negative, and that's bad. I don't have a problem with that. I don't. Like, if this is your scheme, this is your system, and, it, and we've seen it work. In Philadelphia, that's how it's supposed to look. In, in Denver, that's how it's supposed to look. They both, we scored 30-plus points in both of those games. Like, I'm not complaining about that. We know what it's supposed to look like. When it functions at a high level, we just got to get it there, and part of that process is getting Sam into a position where he's not taking bad sacks, he's getting rid of the football, he's taking a check down, and he doesn't like what he sees, he's going through his progressions, etc., etc., etc. So I don't have a problem with them saying, hey, young fella, go through these growing pains, because this is the system, and this is how you're going to thrive. Um. With that said, though, he did, he did acknowledge it. we got to be better. He can't be getting hit this much. Um, I, I hate this whole conversation about Sam being in late in games. 
I, the last thing I need is for him to to be benched in a game and then people thinking, especially the dumb dumbs that don't watch. Oh, Sam Howell got benched. I, I don't. I don't need that. And you, you know, late in the game, you're getting your ass kicked. I don't mind him being in there. I've felt like he's done some good things, even though he's t- taking sacks and things of that nature. And that's on him. You know, there's no. You're, you're down. 15 point there's no 15 point play with two minutes left in the game take the check down i know it sucks and that's not what you want to do but if they're dropping deep and you can't get the ball down the field take the underneath throw stop getting hit um he's got to learn that i don't need him coming out of the game he needs as many reps as he can get so i just want to put that shit to rest and i'm glad eb pretty much put it to rest he's like when i was a player i wanted every rep i can get and I get it, it's different. Running back is different than quarterback. You don't want quarterback getting hit that much. But I think every rep that Sam gets is valuable. I remember leaving that Buffalo game saying he was still throwing dimes at the end of that game despite being sacked, you know, whatever it was, 11 times or whatever the number was. Not, no, it wasn't 11. That was the Giants against the Seahawks. He got sacked nine times in that game. And I remember saying, yo, did you see that throw he had to Curtis Samuel on the sideline? Are you kidding me? That throw he had to Jahan Layton? Are you kidding me? He was throwing dimes at the end of that Bills game. I was encouraged. That showed me that there was still fight. Despite the day that was as bad as it could get. Um, EB also talked about the nature of the offense and you know ball distribution. And again, he talked about Brian Robinson. Wanting to run the ball a little bit more, you know, not wanting to have to get out of the game plan, but you know, it, it, it's happened multiple times this season. And um, he said Brian Robinson, and you know, EB said I don't care about stats, and he's shown that he does not give a shit about stats. Clearly, um, nor should anybody, any coach, offensive play caller, whatever. You shouldn't care about guys getting stats, but you should care about getting your your best players to football. It's not about stats as much as it is just doing the right thing, doing the thing that's going to give you the best chance to win, which is getting the ball in the hands of your best players. So less about stats, more about just doing the thing that's going to help you win, which is what EB is all about. He talked about hating to lose, and, and that's something he's learned as if he didn't already know that. It's like, you know, losing sucks essentially, and I hate losing, and, you know, I've, I've learned a lot. And going through this process, and he had you know a little moment with the, the, the media when he talked about Andy Reid being proud of him for 55 straight pass attempts in that Bears game, uh, and he was right. Eb was right about the second half of the Bears game. We did some really good things, man. If we could just stay out of our own way, that Logan fumble, backbreaking. You know, like golly, we were on the move. Um, Sam's got to hit that two point conversion. And Sam had an opportunity down the field to hit Diami. He's got to hit that. Like, there's so many instances in the game where you look and you say, hey, this could have been something else had these things not transpired. Had we gone for it on fourth and two, um, I think we get it. I don't really think the Bears would have stopped us, to be honest with you. Um, Whether it's Sam using his legs or just finding somebody to get it to for two yards. But, again... We could second guess all we want, replay the game over again. It doesn't matter. It's not going to change the outcome. All we can do is, you know, all they can do is learn from it. And that's what EB's pretty much said. You know, we continue to learn. We're in this process. You know, everything we've gone through, no, we don't want to be two and through, uh, three, but we are. And everything that we've gone through is, is leading us to where we're going. And this is a process that we're, we're going through and we feel really good about the, the steps that we're taking towards the ultimate goal. And he talked about communication and, and that's key. And he said he's seeing players communicate at the line of scrimmage better now and things of that nature. So we'll see how it translates to the field. I, I think they're going to play well against Atlanta. Will it be well enough to win? We'll see. But um, EB said a lot. I don't know if all of it um, necessarily answered the question that was asked or made a ton of sense to some of you, but he, he did say a whole hell of a lot today. Ultimately, I felt good about his message, which essentially was, we're two and three. It's not where we want to be, but we're growing. 
We're getting better. I think the, the, that the hard lessons that we've learned in these first five weeks are going to benefit us. And he said, there is light at the end of this tunnel. And whether you know it or not, this team is getting better on the offensive side of the football. And, and what has my message been to you guys? I said, I'm not worried about the offense. I've, I've been worried about the defense. Before the season started, I was worried about the defense. But I, I think eventually they're going to play better. I've said this with this team since Ron got here. It's consistency that's the missing piece. And EB essentially said, consistency is going to ultimately determine if this offense is what it's supposed to be. You know, we've had our moments. We've had our ball games this year. I don't think we've played four quarters of, of good offensive ball yet. We came close in the Philadelphia game, but the third quarter was pretty dormant for us. Non-existent. We played really good in three quarters of the Denver game. The first quarter was pretty bad, right? I don't think we've had four quarters of consistent play from this offense yet. We do that, we might score 40. We might score 40. We scored 35 points essentially uh, in three quarters against Denver. We scored 31 points in three quarters essentially against Philadelphia. I'd love to see what we do when we, when we actually play for four quarters. Maybe that's what they're working towards. We'll see. Let's get to um, behind enemy lines and um, talk about this game against the Atlanta Falcons. Falcons are three and two. Uh, Washington comes into the game at two and three. Obviously, um, Falcons are currently two and a half point favorites. Uh, so what that tells you is that Vegas thinks we have a legitimate shot to win this game, which we do. If this game were in Washington... You know, we could be one point favorites in this game or it could be a, a push or pick them. Right. Um, usually the home team gets roughly three points when it comes to Vegas odds. So the fact that the Falcons are less than three point favorites tell you that Vegas thinks that this game is a toss up. Still think they still think the Falcons are the better team. Clearly, that's why the odds are in their favor, but not by much. And the records clearly say that, and I think watching these two teams this season, I think anyone who's watched them feels the same way. So uh, with that said, here are some things that I want to point out when it comes to Atlanta heading into this game. Um, first thing, and I know for some of you this is not going to matter because it didn't matter last week. The Bears came into the game worse than the NFL with two sacks, and they left with seven because they sacked Sam Howell five times. So me telling you that the Bears currently are 31st in the league in sacks with five on the season probably doesn't really do much for you. Washington is 31st in the league in sacks given up. They're no longer last. Yay! No longer are we dead last. The Giants have overtaken us. Hooray! Um, but the Bears... Uh, the Lions... Everybody but the Falcons. The Falcons are probably licking their chops, thinking, hey, this is the week we get off, right? This is the week we get our shit off, and we get five or six of our own, and all of a sudden, we're right in the middle of the pack with everybody else. We've got to make sure that that doesn't happen. They haven't gotten to the quarterback. Let's keep it that way. And the only, re only reason I think the Bears got to that number is because at the end of the game, we had to throw, and, and you know, Sam was unwilling to just check it down when you know we got to the end of the game down big and the game's already over it's 37 to 20 there's nothing you can do there's no 17 point play but sam was unwilling to just get rid of it so he got sacked um let's keep the falcons out of positions where they can just tee off and i don't think they're gonna have a ton of sacks in this game but we'll see um, let's talk about third downs. So once upon a time, we were those dudes on third downs defensively. Not anymore. We're, we're not, you know, playing at the level that we started the season off at, at least. So the Falcons are, though. Right now, the Falcons are fifth in the league in third down defense. They're getting off the field on roughly 
just a shade under 33% of third downs. 32.8% they're holding opposing teams to on third downs, right? So they're getting off the field on third downs on roughly 77% or so, roughly, of you know their third downs. They're getting off the field. They're holding teams to 30 2.8% on third downs. It's good for fifth best in the NFL. Meanwhile, we are 25th in third down offensive efficiency. So um, we're only converting third downs at a 36.7% clip. So if that trend continues, it could be another long day for this offense. We're going to have to find a way to convert third downs against a team that has been really stingy on third downs. And when we are unsuccessful as an offense, we don't convert third downs. Some of the talk, a lot of the talk this week amongst the players has been, hey, we got to get that first first down, right? Got to find a way to convert that first third down or, you know, don't have to wait till third down. And I've told people this. It's it, you're allowed to get a first down on first down, or you're allowed to get a first down on second down. You don't have to wait till third down to get a first down. In this offense, it looks like it's going to be a lot of third downs, like it was in Philadelphia when we had 17 of them and we converted eight of them. Be nice to get some first downs on first downs and first downs on second down, and not have to always rely on converting on third downs. But when we do get to third down. We need to find a way to do it against a third down defense in Atlanta that's been pretty good. Speaking of defense, total defense right now, the Falcons are seventh in the NFL. So this is a top 10 defense right now. Now, I know they haven't played you know, the best competition in the world this season. Carolina and Green Bay's offense is in a world beater and Houston's offense. While it's been much better of late, they're still the Texans with a rookie quarterback. So, no, they haven't played the best offenses, but they have played some teams that can score, like Detroit. Uh, Jacksonville can move the football and score. And still, they are holding teams to 295 yards per game, which is the metric that you use for, you know, overall defense. My most important number has always been scoring defense, and I think that number is a bit skewed because they factor in everything. You know, you give up a pick six, they don't subtract that from the amount of points that you give up per game. They just bake it in, you know. Um, <clears throat> so, and Ritter did throw a pick six against Jacksonville. So, you know, the numbers were probably a little bit higher than what it would have been had the Falcons not turned the ball over a few times that probably set other teams up for scoring opportunities. That said, even with that being added into the mix, they're 10th in the league in scoring defense at 19.2 points per game, which is where we thought we would be around this time of the season. We're giving up 32 points a game, folks. <laughs> and I was making all the excuses in the world for this defense. The Bills game, we only gave up 16 points through three quarters. And, you know, this game we had turnovers. And that game we did this and that. And the Hail Mary against Denver, that didn't shouldn't count this... I'm not making no more. We're giving up 32 points a game, damn it. Our defense stinks right now. It is what it is. Meanwhile, they're 10th in the league at 19.2 points a game. So this is a, a defense that's playing solid ball. Not giving up a ton. You know, doing their job. We heard that a lot this week. And so we're going to have to find a way to execute against a team that I told you is, is well coached. Penalties really haven't been an issue for the uh, Falcons this year. They have one game against Green Bay where it was outrageous with six penalties for 110 yards. They still overcame that and won the game, right? So um, another thing that I found interesting, the turnover dif differential. Um, both of us suck. Washington right now is 27th in the NFL with uh, minus five in the turnover differential, which is part of the reason we're un under 500, you know, this is what we've been under Ron Rivera. We don't generate turnovers, even though the mantra this offseason was start fast and create turnovers, which we haven't done either one of those things. Um, and now we're minus five. The Falcons are minus three. And they're 22nd in the NFL. So, um, and, and something that I found interesting, because generally with teams like Atlanta, 
I've talked about they're kind of similar to Tampa Bay. They can't really afford to turn it over and win. They got to take care of the ball. Interesting enough that in their three victories, their plus minus is zero. So they're winning games when they're turning the ball over and not winning the turnover battle. They're overcoming that. Their first win of the season against Carolina, they were plus three. They, they forced three turnovers. They didn't turn it over a single time in that game. They lost the turnover battle to Green Bay, um, one nothing, And they lost the turnover battle to Houston this past weekend, 2 to nothing. So they're not creating turnovers. They're turning it over themselves. And they're still winning games. Now, the games that they've lost, they've turned it over. Like, so it doesn't really matter, per se, with them. They've won turning it over. They've lost turning it over. I'd like to see, I'd like to put this theory to test, though. I'd love, I'd love to see if they turn it over and still can beat us. We'd have to get turnovers in order that, for that to happen, though. Something that we generally don't do. Um, obviously, I've already mentioned this to you guys earlier in the week. Desmond Ritter is coming off of his best game. First 300-yard performance of his career. So they're feeling really good about uh, where he is in his maturation. Bijan Robinson is a beast. Um, I think Ritter is starting to really gain confidence throwing the football to Drake London. He had a big 32-yard catch, which is the biggest of his career to, that, to this point. Helmet came off. He went nuts. The crowd went nuts. It was like one of those moments that helped spark them in that game. And so... Um, there's, he threw it to 11 different receivers in that Texans game, spread it around. So this is an offense that has a lot of guys that can get the ball to. Their leading receiver right now isn't Drake London. It isn't Kyle Pitts. It's Janu Smith, not Kyle Pitts. Okay, it's the other tight end. So um, they got a bunch of guys they can get the ball to. So unlike past weeks where you're like, hey, we got to try to take this guy away or that guy away. They got a bunch of guys. We still got to try to take away Bijan Robinson. He's really the guy that this offense, you know, goes through, especially when you get into the red zone. So uh, <clears throat> a lot of things that we're going to have to go into this game and, and try to defend against. But um, Robinson is at the top of the list. Uh, you can get to Ritter. He has been sacked this season, but he did a really good job of eluding pressure this last game against Houston which is why he was able to, to go over 300 yards. He extended plays, made some things happen um, off schedule. So another guy that's slippery, another guy that can use his legs to extend plays. We're going to have to be ready. We haven't had the most success against mobile quarterbacks, as you all know. So we'll see how we fare against Desmond Ritter and the Atlanta Falcons. They've missed one field goal on the season. Okay, They're 9 of 10. So, you know, Young Wei Ku is one of the better kickers in the league. So if you're looking for help in that department, either we get super lucky, but the likelihood is he's not going to miss. So if this thing comes down to a late field goal, we lose pretty much is what I'm telling you. So let's not let it come down to a late field goal. Uh, but this is a, this is a, a pretty good ball, ball club. Like nothing flashy about the Atlanta Falcons. They're not going to knock your socks off with any one thing that they do in particular. They just do a lot of things solidly. And unless you force them out of their comfort zone, they're going to do the things that they're comfortable doing. So it's our job to force Desmond Ritter to beat us. That, that, the same thing that I said against the Eagles when it came to Jalen Hurts. Don't let Hurts lean on the run game. Make him beat us. And he did. Make Desmond Ritter do the same thing. You know, I, I said the same thing about the Bears and Justin Fields. We didn't do a good job stopping their run game. They were before all of their backs got hurt. They were running all over us. It was embarrassing. That if we come with that same defensive effort on the ground against Bijan Robinson, he'll have two hundred yards rushing. He'll have two hundred yards rushing. So they better be ready to stop the run on Sunday. Anyway. I digress. Um, tomorrow we'll have our full breakdown, keys to victory, um, and our final outcome for this pivotal matchup 
you know, one thing that somebody asked EB about, um, and, and they, you know, they and, and I finally was able to see Terry's interview because it was um, janky on the site last, yesterday, would, wouldn't show up. And JP Finley asked Terry about, you know, the slow starts and these things getting out of control. Because EB doesn't know anything about those. He wasn't here for those. But Terry's been here for all of them. And he's like, yeah, like, it's, that's a real thing. And, and you'd be a damn fool to think that the players haven't acknowledged it and, and don't know that this has been their MO. And he's like, we got a chance to nip this shit in the bud right here and get back to 500. You know, the only way to stop a slide is to go out and stop it. So we got an opportunity in front of us. Here it is. Talk is cheap. Go do it. I'll believe it when I see it. But the opportunity is there. This is a very, very winnable game. How bad do you want it? We'll see. But it's going to do it for me, your man Louis T, here on Commander's Nightly News. You know what it is. Post up. Take command. I'll see you guys next time. For some of you, I'll see you live tonight after Chiefs and Broncos. For the rest of you, I'll see you tomorrow during the Louis T Network podcast. And the rest of you, I'll see you for the CNN on Friday when we look to roll those boys. Have a good one. Here comes the diesel. Here comes the diesel. There's the snap, hand to Riggins. Good hole. He's got the first down to the 40. He's gone. The 35, the 30, the 20. He's gone.